So that's what we're going to be looking at tonight. The heartbeat of servant leadership is investing in people. That's the heartbeat. Last week, we looked at becoming a deep well. We become a deep well so that others can become deep wells. If we're shallow in who we are, we reproduce shallow people. But if we're deep in Jesus, deep in the Lord, then we reproduce depth in others as well. So this tonight, we're beginning to transition to look at how we can serve others. Like I said, next week, uh, we're going to do a short teaching slot. uh, But then it becomes personal. It's going to be a commitment that we make. Are we going to be committed to grab a towel, to follow Jesus' example, to grab a towel, and to serve others as well? We're going to pray for one another, and we're going to be commissioned with some praise and worship. But because this is such a, I mean, a little bit different this evening, it's such an important topic. Just check that this is on and this is working. Yes, putting people first. This is such an important topic. You know, in, in Hebrews 11, it talks about the great cloud of witnesses, doesn't it? Christians that have gone throughout history, um, who, who are our witnesses, who are cheering us on in the faith. You know, whenever we feel discouraged or whenever we feel down as Christians, sometimes it's great to remember we're not the only Christian that's ever lived, you know. There are others that have followed Jesus faithfully throughout their lives. And they're this great cloud of witnesses. It's like in a stadium and we're in a marathon. And they're the ones who are cheering us on, saying, Tim, go on, keep going, you can do it. You can keep going, you can reach the finish line. Well, tonight, because it's such an important topic, I'm going to be drawing from the great cloud of witnesses. A lot of, you're going to see on the screen, a lot of quotes, a lot of people who have run this race and who've given kind of insight and wisdom into this area of how we can serve others and how we can put people first. You see, there's a problem. To put people first means we're going to be part of a community. But we live in a society that actually looks a bit more like this. Individualism. Everyone on their own tower. Everyone building their own empire. In fact, we've talked about this, haven't we? The picture of leadership is the superhero leader who's out there, who's doing their own thing and living in isolation. Look at them all in glass houses, building their towers. We live in an age where actually people, they want to be the self-made person. Have you heard that? They they take great pride. I'm a self-made person, you know, as if no, no one ever helped us. You know, it's actually a great lie. You know, I am who I am today because of people who've invested into me. People who've gone before me, who've set an example for me to follow. Individualism is in some ways a great curse on our age. We talk about climbing the corporate ladder. We talk about looking after number one. We don't find, we found already that this is not true of Scripture. There's nothing in Scripture that says about individualism. Actually, a great Chinese author wrote this. He says, God does not blame me for being an individual. In fact, there's uniqueness. We saw that last week. God has created us uniquely. But for my individualism, when I put myself first, his greatest problem, and God's greatest problem in the world, is not the outward divisions and denominations that divide his church, but our own individualistic hearts. What's he saying here? The reason we have division in the church is not because we like different names or different buildings or whatever. It's because in our hearts, we divide. We're divisive in our hearts, aren't we? So we set ourselves up against one another. And that picture that we saw could equally be a thousand churches with a thousand different people in their own individual towers. Watchman Nee goes on to say, sin self-reliance, and individualism were Satan's master strokes. He knew if he could divide us, divide and conquer, we know that. Well, it started at the fall when he set Adam against Eve. He divided and he conquered, and Satan, that's been his tactic ever since, individualism, dividing and conquer. was it Satan's master strokes at the heart of God's purpose in man, but thankfully in the cross, God has undone them. In the cross, we are united again. In the cross, we have that common ground. Individualism, Satan's masterstroke. You know, the thing with individualism, though, I mean, I've, as, I, as you've learned about me, I've now been in South Africa on the African continent for 20 years. And, and one of the things I love about Africa is actually here, there's a greater sense of community. 
isn't there? We hear, I mean, Africa knows about community. We talk about the concept of Ubuntu, about the interdependence that we have. This concept of individualism is actually foreign in this context here. I mean, Cape Town itself, even in the, the terrible days of apartheid, we had pockets, even Woodstock, one of those pockets, um, um, District 6, another of those pockets where community thrived, even amidst great difficulties. There's something in us that needs one another, and I believe that's a God-given thing. The Holy Trinity lives in perfect fellowship, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If it's good enough for God to live in community, surely it's good enough for us to live in community. You see, we can say Ubuntu is a great African philosophy, but actually when we look at Scripture, we see the, the interdependence, not independence, is the hallmark of Christianity. One professor writes this, the Bible properly understood, can you everybody see the screen by the way, okay, the Bible properly understood does not teach individualism anywhere. There's no isolation in the Bible. Old Testament history continually affirms the solidarity, the togetherness of God's people. And we just have to look at our greatest example, Jesus, who said this to his followers. He said, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. Isn't it remarkable? The son of God, the king of kings, the Lord of heaven, the one who created heavens and earth, who was with God from the beginning and in God. He, he became a person, but he didn't become a person to rule. He became a person to become a friend. He became a person to befriend those who were with him, the disciples, his closest friends. Even the vulnerability of that, we know friendship is a vulnerable place, isn't it? You're prone to being hurt if you're a friend. You're prone to being misunderstood. You're vulnerable as a friend. Yet Jesus, the Son of God, made him that vulnerable that he became friends, that those nearest and dearest to him could actually hurt him, could abandon him, could offend him. And yet he considered it. He could have avoided all of that. He considered it so important as an example for us to follow that he said, I have called you friends. It is the model he has for us. It's the community model. If we grab a towel and follow Jesus' leadership, we're in the friendship business. We're in the friendship business. You know, a lot of people, we're talking about leadership. There's a myth today. I gave you some myths last week. I'm not going to give you too many today. But there's a myth that says that leadership is lonely. Anyone heard that? That leadership is a lonely place to be. I think it's a lie. I've heard pastors say it to me, and I understand because people get hurt and they build barriers around themselves and they're scared of, of that interrelationship that can lead to hurt, but actually God has made us for community. Leadership in lo is lonely, is, is that superhero leader that's out there in the front breaking down every barrier and hoping the followers can keep up with him. Whereas actually the friendship model of leadership is we're in this together, we're gathering around. I can't solve every problem, but together we can do things. We're going to look at some of that tonight. That's the friendship model of leadership. I become a better person because I'm in relationship with you. I don't have all the answers, but also because of me, you will become a better person. And there's something of me that I want to deposit into you. That's what servant leadership is all about. It's friendship. Because this, for servant leaders, people are the priority. Relationships are the priority. It's all about people first. Tonight we're grabbing a towel. And we're saying we're following Jesus' example. As he knelt at his disciples' feet, they were his friends. And he washed his feet. Who are our friends? Who are the ones that put, God has put in our influence that we need to serve? We, who are we going to put first in our lives and live in order to make their lives better? What we're going to do this evening is we're going to look at three T's. It's not just because I'm two of those T's, Tim Tucker. Uh, we're going to look at three other T's. Uh, we're going to look at together, teamwork, and trust. And I've mentioned some of these are covered in the book. If you've read the chapter on putting people first. But what I want to do is move from some of the theory and get practical. And ask how we as servant leaders can grab a towel, follow Christ's example. And practically what does it look like to put people first.
So the first one is this. We're in this together. I'm going to come back to that slide. And I'm firstly going to show you what this doesn't look like. And we've got a video clip to help us with that. You know what's wrong with South Africa? All you foreigners. You must all go back to where you came from. <laughs> you Cameroonians, Congolese, Pakistanis, Somalis, Ghanaians, and Kenyans. And of course, you Nigerians. And you Europeans. Let's not forget all you Indians and Chinese. Even you Afrikaners. Back to Swaziland for your Swatis, the Sutu for your Sutu, Swanas, Venda, Zulus, everybody. Real South Africans love diversity. That's why we have introduced two more items, new peri wings and delicious chinchado and chips. Only Nando's. If you've not seen that advert, it was banned, um, but I downloaded it. Because <laughs> everyone's a bit worried for the first little while. But you know what? It's a great picture, isn't it? We love to divide people. We love to put people in boxes. We live in a world that divides, that's, that talks about our difference, that, dis, that, that promotes disunity rather than unity. Whereas if we want to be those who put people first, we've got to realize we're in this together. We're in this together. There's power in unity. There's destruction in division. Jesus said, this is my command, love each other. And we say it there at the end of that passage that we read. But I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command, love each other. And I feel it's a command with a condition that all those promises, we can't expect them to come true if we're not loving each other. How can we expect to be fruitful, to bear fruit that will last? How can we expect to ask whatever in Jesus' name if we're not loving one another? It's almost like he's saying, because if you're loving one another, I know you will ask for good things. If you're loving one another, you will be looking for good fruits for each other. You're not looking out for your own interests. You're looking for the interests of others. Love is the critical ingredient to foster unity. And maybe you'll read a lot of leadership books, maybe you'll read a lot of books out there, secular books, but they won't use the, the L word that often. For a leader to love means a leader is vulnerable. For, but for a servant leader, it is essential if we're gonna put people first. Christ-centered servant leaders are gonna lead with love, it's got to be an identifying mark. So what does this look like practically? There is actually a book that I've read. It's a book by a guy called Joel Manby, and his book is called Lead with Love. And he's not a Christian. He's not a church-based Christian leader. He's actually in the marketplace. He's in the business. And he said he's put these principles into practice that he runs his, bu his business based upon 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And he leads with these as his primary way of putting people first and loving effectively. Let's read the familiar verses of 1 Corinthians 13. I'll start from verse 3. If, if I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy does not boast, it is not proud, it does not honor, sorry, it does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always persevere. Love never fails. And then it talks about some things that will fail, and then it says in verse 13, and now these three remain, faith, hope and love, but the greatest of these is love. We could change the word there. Christ-centered servant leaders are patient, leaders are kind. Think about the leaders in your life, in your workplace. Is this true of them? <laughs> is this true of you? Is it true of the school teachers that, that you've, been, you've had or your university professors? But these are the aspirations for us. 
as people of influence. Leaders are not proud. They do not dishonor others. They are not self-seeking. They are not easily angered. They keep no record of wrong. Leaders do not delight in evil, but rejoice with the truth. They always protect, always trust, always hope, always persevere. And maybe if that's the kind of leader, we might be the kind of leaders that don't fail in our task of putting people first. Joel Manby in that book, he talks about these seven principles that he's applied. Patience, kindness, trusting, unselfish, truthful, forgiving, dedicated. What beautiful principles. These are the practical expressions of love. Love isn't that airy-fairy feeling, is it? This is what it means to love people. If we love people, we're patient with them. We're not exasperated by them. We're patient with them. If we love people, we're kind. We look for people's good interests. If we love people, we trust. We'll come back to that later. If we love, we're unselfish. We give generously. If we love people, we're truthful. And we're, we hold to the full truth, not to the half-truths or the white lies. But we're truthful. Our yes is yes and our no is no. We're forgiving and we're dedicated. A few things he specifically says about these qualities that can maybe then help us put even a little bit more flesh on what it is for us to, to, to foster. This is about fostering that spirit of togetherness. To foster unity, we need to be displaying these characteristics of love. So leading with love, he says this, treating someone with love, regardless of how you feel about that person, is a very powerful principle. We love because Jesus told us to, not because of how we feel about someone in a given moment. We look for what is lovable in a person. And if all we can say is, well, actually you were created by the Lord, we love that in them. <laughs> God has a purpose and a plan. And we look past what is physically there and we say we love who you are, the potential of who you are in Christ. And we call that to life. We love and we go on loving. It says we must always admonish with patience and respect. So we're not anti-truth. We're not even anti-helping people when they're, when they're struggling. But we admonish, we correct people with patience and respect. Our goal isn't simply performance. You know, in leadership speak, often it's do whatever it takes to get someone to perform. Find out if they need the carrot or the stick. If the, the kind of person that they need the stick, well, punish them until they perform. You know, if they need the carrots, reward them, reward them, reward them. You know, but actually that you can, you can harm someone's dignity in treating them in that way. Everyone is an individual. If we love them, we find out what is the environment that helps them to flourish. What is it, if you're a parent, what is the environment that helps your child to flourish? And our, each of our children, we've got three children, they're all different, they're unique. We love them equally, but we love them, this is Christina's phrase, uniquely. Uni we find out what does it take for them to flourish, and we try and provide an environment for that. That's what it means to help people, and sometimes that takes patience, and it also it means we respect, we respect the dignity of the person, respect the dignity of the people and your team, if that's your family, if it's your life group, if it's your youth group, if it's your, your team at work, if it's the team you're on or the team you're leading, there's people you're influencing in that way. Kindness, I love this, kindness isn't an add-on. <laughs> kindness isn't an add-on, it's part of who we are as Christians should be to, to be kind. It's a critical component of any well-run organization. Kindness is the root of encouragement. Encouragement leads to enthusiasm and everyone benefits. Does anyone here not like to be encouraged? Well, who likes to be encouraged? Great job. You're doing well. Love what you're doing. You sang beautifully. You served at the door fantastically. That was a great cup of tea. It didn't burn my tongue. You know, we love <laughs> encouragement. Something else we love, you know what? In the, you know this thing about gossip? Gossip is terrible. Who likes to know that they've been gossiped about? It's horrible, isn't it? But there's something I've learned about part of in the message. There's something that we call um, the, the, the hearing of a good report. You know what's a beautiful thing? It, is, if, if, is, it, is if I go to Evangeline and say, you know what? I was served beautifully 
by your team when I came. They made me a cup of tea. Your team are amazing. Your church here, they're fantastic people. And then Evangeline can go to that person and say, you know what? You know what Tim said? Tim said you made him the best cup of tea he's had today. And now you know that people are speaking nicely behind your back. It's good to hear when someone has said good things. Okay, tell people to their face. But even better if you sometimes hear a report from someone else that you've blessed them in some way. You've prayed for them. You've encouraged them. That's the beautiful thing about kindness. We're always looking for the good that someone has done. And we pray for the things that are praiseworthy. And that what that can lead to is if we want to, to discipline ourselves, here's a very practical thing. Spend part of every day actively encouraging behavior you want to reinforce. If someone's done something good and you think, I would like that person to do that even more, <laughs> don't tell them about all the bad things they do. Tell them about the, if there's one thing, even your child, if there's one good thing that they've done that day, don't tell them about the 10 bad things they've done. You might need to, but focus on the good thing. Let them know there's good that they are doing. Encourage that. Speak truth. Speak life. Speak health into people, spend part of every day. You know, this, the author of this book says he still writes notes and leaves notes around. You know, for me, I wish I did it every day, but I try and send to my team a WhatsApp message. If I see someone's done a good thing, they get a WhatsApp message saying, well done, that was great. I want to encourage you in that, or even better, if I can go face to face to them and say, good stuff, that was really, really great. Look for the, look for the behavior that you think, that's quality. And then verbalize it, say something good, send a note, send a message that will reinforce it. This one as well, it's, it's, it's a good principle for us as well. Uh, uh, the best decisions are always made with, not for. And showing that kind of trust is a true attribute of leading with love. Don't always, it's about empowerment. There's a whole chapter on empowerment in the book that we're not really going to get to. But, but you know, the, the worst thing we can do is make decisions on behalf of other people and become problem solvers. Sometimes what we need to do is sit down with people and help them learn the how to make good decisions. Come alongside them. Let them make the decisions themselves. Let them understand that you care enough and love them enough to be able to trust them to make decisions and to move on in life. It's an act, an act of love uh, is to allow people, even if that means they're going to make some mistakes along the way, trust people and stand with them in that. And this is just a reminder, if we have nobody telling us the real truth, we will not improve over time. Oscar Wilde, the author, said this. He says, a true friend stabs you in the front. So if you've got something, if it is a, an admonition or correction, don't tell the next person the mistakes someone has made. Out of love and respect, because if you're doing the other six things there, you know what? People will gladly receive your positive criticism because they know you've got your best interests at heart. If you're their friend, they'll expect that stabbing in the front because they know actually they'd rather hear the hard words from you because you love them than from somebody else who has no interest in them at all. These are practical ways that we foster unity. We stand together. If we create that kind of environment, man, we can be allies. We stand together in this world. And what a beautiful thing that can be. We can then, this, with this kind of environment, we can unite in the common cause, the cause of Christ. Love is the critical ingredient which enables us to submit. You know, the Bible says we must submit to one another as unto the Lord. People don't necessarily like this word submission in the 21st century. We think it's more about abuse and about you must do what I say no matter what. Actually, mutual submission is understanding that we have one another's best interests at heart. And so, so it's an act of love to submit to one another because I know that we're in this together. You've got my back. I've got your back. Basketball coach. Have I missed one there? Okay, we'll, go, we'll move on. John Wooden uh, in the last century said this, it's amazing how much can be accomplished when no one cares who gets the credit. Again, this is moving us from individualism and saying we're in this together. We're in this together in the cause of Christ. So together, everyone say together. Yeah. Together, we're in this together. That's the first thing about putting people first. Commitment to unity. The second thing, the second T is teamwork. 
Teamwork, really, it's a cliche, but you know what, some cliches are true. Teamwork does make the dream work. <laughs> John Maxwell says, one of the leadership authors and one of the great clouds of witnesses, he says, one is too small a number to achieve greatness. Individualism, individual, you can't achieve greatness alone. We need to be part of a team. At The Message, we have this phrase, a very Engl quintessential English phrase called being mates on mission. And uh, we have to sometimes explain what mates is, but mates is another term for friends in our context. Uh, and nothing untoward about that. Uh, so, so mates on mission means we're friends, we're in this together. You know, actually, you know, what, sometimes what brings us together is the mission. You know, we've got a purpose, even as a church, it can be we've got a purpose. I love the way we worship together. I love the outreach and the vision of the church. But you know what will keep us together? Friendship will keep us together through the ups and downs, being mates on mission. We're learning that as the message. You know, people come and go in the organization. They come and they, and they see the mission and they like what they're doing, but maybe they're coming for their own self-advancement or their own thing. But actually, the ones that stay, the ones that really commit, are the ones you have a heart connection with and say this is something more than just achieving goals. We, act, we need teams. You know, teamwork is a beautiful thing and we're going to watch two beautiful moments about teamwork. I very much doubt it. They look very, very tired at the moment, Italy. They had a very hard game in the semi-finals against West Germany where they had to play extra time. And possibly it's having some effect on them now. And when Brazil get into a situation like this, they're very, very difficult to beat. Yes, it would be cruel to say it, but uh, giving away a two-goal advantage can only happen once in the 1970 World Cup, and we know who did that. I don't think Brazil are going to do it here. Erzino, faced by Facchetti. Oh, it's not a bad ball for Pelle on the right side. It's Carlos Alberto. And what a great goal that was! <laughs> Carlos Alberto! First team? Well, who is the first team? Brazil. Brazil, 1970 World Cup. One of the greatest teams ever, possibly uh, considered one of the greatest goals um, ever. Uh, second team was? Spain. Who scored the goal? Yes, okay, good stuff, good stuff. You know your, you know your stuff. <laughs> it wasn't Pele. Pele gave the assist. It was actually Carlos Alberta. Who got, the, who got the final goal, Pelé made the assist. So, um, I mean, I think for me, it's like we, we can look at a Ronaldo who scores the incredible individual goals uh, and there's something great, you can see something great about that. But there's something beautiful in the teamwork 
I mean, that Spanish goal where every player took part, every player had a role to play. They stayed in their positions. They called it the tiki-taka football. Um, and eventually, they got the goal. And Christina said, did they go and win the game? I was like, well, it's against Scotland. Of course they won the game. Uh, John Wooden says, uh, the, 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 sorry, the same guy as the quote earlier, the basketball coach, he says, the greatest element in stardom is the rest of the team. The greatest element in stardom is the rest of the team. But we see this in scripture, don't we? Uh, in Paul's analogy of the body in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Actually, the preceding passage to the love passage, you know, he talks about the importance of teamwork, and then he's like, well, how are we going to keep the teamwork going? He talks about love. Then in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12 to 14, did I put this on the screen? Let me just see. Yep. He said, just as a body, though one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we all baptize by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Greek or Gentile, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink, even so the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And God has placed in the church, first of all, apostles, prophets, teachers, their miracles and gifts of healing, of helping, of guidance, and of different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do all work miracles, do all have gifts of healing, do all speak in tongues, do all interpret He's begging the answer. He says, the answer is no, they don't. Everybody has a role to play. There's diversity in the team. You are part of this team. You have a role to play. Teamwork is a beautiful thing. We need to know our part in in it. And we need to play because we're not playing for our own glory. And when we're not taking our part in the team, we're actually letting our teammates down. That's what he's saying. We all have a part to play. So we can all agree on this, but what does it take? What are some keys to becoming a great team? We looked at what it looks like to be together in unity. Here are some keys. If we want to be a great team, you need to become a great team player. And here are five keys to help you become a team player. The first thing, if you want, we talked about this already, so I'm not going to, a few weeks ago, but if you want to beco- become a good team player and, and, and become a great team, you first need to be a good follower. You need to be a good follower. Part of leadership, part of servant leadership, George Barna says, is knowing when to follow. You have to know when to get out of the way. It's not all about you. <laughs> it's all about the team. It's not all about your name. It's about the Lord's name. It's not about your role and what you function. It's about what Grace Chapel does in the neighborhood. You're part of a team. If you're in the worship team, you're part of a team. If you're in a life group, if you're in youth ministry, if you're in young adults ministry, even in your workplace, you're part of a team. So we also need to be able to follow. We need to follow and know it's not about us. It's about us serving together. Part of that then is we need to know and play to your strengths. And again, a sports team is a great analogy for this. The greatest teams are made up of not all the same style of player. If the Brazil team only had players like Pele, they would never have become the great world champions that they were. They needed a goalkeeper. Sometimes you think the goalkeeper must be the most craziest guy in the world. Who wants to go diving at the feet of a striker. You know, the goalkeeper are bored for 90 minutes of the game, but they've got to concentrate because they don't know when that shot is going to come. And they've got to be ready. There's a set of skills that a goalkeeper has that if they don't play their part, he's going to let the rest of the team down. The same with the defenders, same with the midfielders and the strikers. Not everybody can be the one that scores the goal, but when the goal comes, the whole team gets the glory. That's the role of teamwork. You know what, a friend of mine used to play for Manchester United, name dropping right now. Uh, some United fans, we don't keep it, we keep it quiet these days. That's why I'm wearing black. <laughs> but he said, you know what, on any given day, they would go out of the tunnel, Alex Ferguson would send them out, it's back in the day, out of that tunnel. And they would know actually that three or four of them may not play to their maximum potential that day. So sometimes you could see he would play with Eric Cantona, the great maverick French player. He would know Eric Cantona is going to have a bad day today. The other players need to step up and fill the gap. 
On a team, you're not going to perform 100% every single game, but you're part of a team. You have strengths and weaknesses. You balance one another, and you work together. We need to know your gifts. You know, there's a lot of ways you can learn your gifts. There's a lot of tests you can do. There's tests uh, both for spiritual gifts in the Bible. We don't have time to go into some of these things now. Uh, but also your strengths as a whole thing. You can do online assessment to find your strengths. Find the things that you're good at. What you've been wired about. And find contentment in the things that God has gifted you in. And serve in that area. If we can't all be those other things, find the things and find contentment in the place that God has for you. And you know what? If you don't know your gifts, you know what the best thing to do is not actually do the online assessments. They can be helpful. But I'll tell you some people who will know. Your friends, your family. Ask people, what are my strengths? What do I flourish at? Where have you seen me my happiest? And they can give you insight. Because if you're in this together, they've got their best interests at heart. They'll be able to tell you your strengths. They'll be able to tell you how you can begin to flourish. And maybe it'll be different from some of the things you've aspired to. We can't all be teachers. We can't all be on the platform. We can't all be doing these other things. But you'll find great satisfaction in doing the things you're called to do, that God has gifted you in. So know your strengths and then play to your strengths. It's an important part of being part of a team. We need to cultivate interaction. If we're servant leaders, I've touched on this already, but we're interested in other people's opinions. There's a great leadership book written by Henry and Richard Blackaby called Spiritual Leadership, but they said this, effective leaders make a concerted effort to invite discussion and constructive feedback from all associates. Okay, as a very technical language, the pastor of my church, Pastor Steve Van Ryan, says this, the best idea in the room wins. So it doesn't matter your position in the organization. It doesn't matter if your position in the church. If we invite interaction, we get feedback from people, the best idea wins. It doesn't have to be my idea just because I'm the so-called CEO or whatever. If someone's got a better idea, it might come from the cleaning lady in the office. She might have a way better idea about how we should organize things than what I do. The best idea wins. Get interaction. Allow people to speak. Because if someone is sat there with the greatest idea and they're never given the permission to speak, we all suffer. We all suffer because of that. Cultivate interaction. Key four, pursue diversity and ensure quality. You know what? God has given us a gift in the church that we all come from different backgrounds. We're different ages. We're from both genders. We're young and we're old. The church is a diverse place and that is a beautiful thing for a team, but we also need to intentionally pursue other forms of diversity. John Piper, the great church leader and author, says, unity in diversity is more beautiful and more powerful than the unity of uniformity. You know, it's easy to do the people, to hang out with the people who look like you, who talk like you, who think like you, who have the same educational background as you, the same kind of family culture as you. That's easy, and it doesn't bring much glory to God. God, if God had wanted us to be that, he'd have made us all the same. The same color skin, the same sex, the same, everything the same. God wants, God loves diversity. Just look at creation. God loves diversity. And we, his people, should be reflecting that diversity because it gives him great glory. But even more than that, we can learn so much from one of the pe other people. We learn from those who've had different experiences, different backgrounds, who don't look like us, who don't think like us. We learn. God has created them equally as he's created you. And if we understand we are all equal in this way, not like that Nando's advert. If we're not like that, if that's not our approach, then we can become all the richer for it. A South African, well, a South African author writes this, unity and diversity is not an option for the church. It is essential and needs to be intentionally sought out after. If we want to build great teams and be a great team player, try and get to know some people who are not like you <laughs> and learn from them. South Africa needs this more than ever. And the church, we have a unique opportunity that no other body in the whole of the country has to build unity in diversity. It's hard work. Of course it is. But there's something beautiful that can come from it. Something that brings much glory to God. I'm going to skip that one because I've basically covered it already. So, so there are some keys for us. If you want to build great teams, be a good follower. Know and play to your strengths. Have interaction. Get feedback. And pursue diversity. 
but diversity within a framework of equality. We're all equals. It's not about the titles. We've touched on that before. It's not about those things. We're all equals. We all have a unique part to play. When we're like that, when we're open-handed, when we're open-hearted, then God can build a great team, an effective team that can do great things for him. That's when actually we're mates on mission. But there's one ingredient that I think really needs to be emphasized even more highly, and that's this, the third ingredient to be the kind of people that put others first is trust. Trust is a critical word. It's the essential ingredient for teams that work together, this word trust. Trust is powerful. We know from Scripture that trust is a powerful force. Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6, it's my, my life verse. My children put it, I don't have my dog tags here, but it's on my dog tags. Trust, it's been given me so many times, I can't even remember. Trust in the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your strength. Trust in him, and he will make your paths straight. Acknowledge him in all your ways. Trust him. Trust him. Jesus in John 14, verse 1, said, don't let your hearts be troubled. It says, believe or trust in God. Trust also in me. Trust is at the core of our faith. It's at the core of who we are. Trust builds bridges between us and God. We have to trust him. If we're not trusting him, we'd have no salvation. It's through trusting him that we are saved and we receive eternal life. That's essential. But actually, just as we trust in him, so we're to have relationships of trust with one another. Servant leaders understand the power of trust, but however, so does the evil one. He can break down trust. He can destroy relationships. I'm sure we've always seen this, haven't we? You, we've all said to a friend who's hurt us, I'm just not sure I can trust you again. We know it's a powerful, motivating force. If we have strong and high levels of trust, if you trust your leader in the church, as I've seen you do, you'll do whatever it takes <laughs> to be a blessing, to take the vision and the mission forward. But if there's no trust, it becomes a toxic environment where everybody, with an environment of mistrust, I've experienced this in a previous organization, when trust is broken, suddenly no one feels safe. No one feels secure anymore. We know it in a family as well. Trust, it's critical. It's the powerful motivating factor for us to build teams that will work together. Trust is a two-way street. You as a, in terms of leadership, being a servant leader, you have to trust the people that you're following, that are following you. To trust the people, even with your children, with your in spheres of influence. If you show no trust in them, how would you expect them to put trust in you? People actually rise too often to the level of trust we put into them. It's risky, isn't it? Because people can make mistakes. And that's why Stephen Covey, an author, says that trust is like a bank account. He wrote the book, The, Habits, Hi effective ha the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, a great book. Um, he said, trust is like an emotional bank account. When we do good, when we, when, we, when, we do, when we build confidence with someone, when we treat someone with respect, when we show love, the kind of things that we've been talking about, it's like we put, a bank, uh, we put money in their bank account and we build up savings that they say, wow, I can trust this person because they've been good to me. I know they're for me. They're not against me, you know? And, and if you've got a big bank account, if then you blow it and you make a mistake, like you've got this bank account of 100,000 rand worth of trust in someone's heart, and you blow it and you make a mistake, it's like taking withdrawal of 5,000 rand. It's not emptying it. There's still 95,000 there, and it, you can begin to top it up. It's not devastating. But if, unless you build a track record, unless you place a deposit of tr in someone, then when you blow it, if, the, if, you, if there's only 5,000 rand or 100 rand worth of trust in a relationship, and then you blow it and you make a mistake, people will find it hard to trust you again. So we build that confidence, that bank account of trust through these things we've been talking about, and it becomes a highly motivating factor. Stephen Covey goes on to give us some advice. Deposits we can make into other people's lives 
that demonstrate, that build these, this, this bank account of trust. Are you with me on that? You understand what I'm getting at? How you want to make deposits into people's lives, into their bank accounts so that they will trust you. Have high trust levels so that you can do great things together. These are some of the advice. Understand people. Understand Try and understand where someone is coming from. You know what? The biggest thing we can do with this is listen to people. I know if someone really listens to me, it's someone I can begin to trust. If they take the time, you know what? I think as Christians, we need to become really good at asking good questions about people. Not just, how are you today? I'm fine. You know? Asking really good questions about people's background, about their history, about their context, their family, their environment. Show interest in their day. Show interest in who they are. It builds trust. So many of us, all we're doing in a conversation is waiting for the next opportunity to give our opinion, to speak, to say something. And I'm guilty of that. I think I've got a great idea. Just shut up. I want to tell you my great idea. I'm not, now I'm not listening to a word you're saying. You're actually back. You're going on. You're going on. You're going on. Just shut up. I've got something to tell you. And I miss the entire thing that they've said to me. You know, that's the conversation that's going on in my head. You know, and we're trying for ways to interrupt. When can I interrupt? When can I interrupt? Your know, hand signals, you start getting fidgety. And you, you know, and some people never even let you start, do they? They're just giving you their opinion. You know, I sometimes, so often, I've said to people, oh, I'm thinking about what, and then before I've even said anything, they're like, you know what you should do? I'm like, well, maybe I do know, but you obviously want to tell me what I should do. <laughs> So now I've got to listen to you, and I thought this was a point when you were supposed to be listening to me. <laughs> listening. Skills of listening. Really important for us. We don't all have to be trained counselors, but we all have two ears and one mouth, and we all know that we should listen twice as much as what we speak. So learning to listen builds trust. The second thing, attend to the little things. These are all deposits. You know, it's not one major thing that makes you a trustworthy person. It's a stack of a hundred little things. So attending to little things. In relationships, Stephen Covey says, the little things are the big things. Keeping to time, doing what you said you were going to do. If you promised to, to get something for the shops from somebody get the thing from the shops for the somebody. And if you can't do it, don't promise to do it. You know, if you said you're going to pray for someone, well, what I try and do is if I don't pray for them, I'm probably going to forget. So make sure you pray for the person you said or write it down. Uh, attend to the little things because the little things add up to the big things. Be a person of our word. The second one is, is a bit like that, keeping commitments. If you've arranged a meeting with someone, sometimes things come up. But letting someone know if there's an expectation that you're part of a team that you should be doing something and, and there's a commitment you've made, keep to the commitment that you've made. If you, if you can't do it, say you can't do it. Let our yes be yes and our no, no. Not keeping our commitments is a major withdrawal. We've all been there, haven't we? Waiting for the person to go to the movies who said they were going to phone us and plan to go and then they contact you after the movie's finished and said, oh, I'm sorry, something came up. And you're wondering, well, what possibly could have come up that you couldn't have told me in advance you weren't going to make it? We've all been there for the coffee dates or the commitments or the, or the you know, the, the, the ministry team member who was supposed to and said they would come, but you knew that probably they wouldn't come, so you'd better come and get there early and put the kettle on yourself just in case they didn't come because the last five times they've not come. Keeping commitments. When we don't keep commitments, it's a major withdrawal. People are not sure whether you're trustworthy if you don't do what you're going to say. Sometimes we have to clarify expectations. Something I've learned, over-promising and under-delivering is a major withdrawal. You know, as a leader in an organization, people like to promise the world, you know, particularly in an interview. You do an interview and it's like, man, this person should be president of the country. You know, you look at their CV, it's like, it's like the fact is they, they made one deposit once in the, to the bank account and now they're an accountant. You know, they've, done, uh, they're, they're, they've got this CV and, and, and we're in a world that people are self-branding. We're over-promising every day. We're over-promising because we touch up our Facebook profile and we remove all the blemishes and we make ourselves look something that we're actually not. <laughs> and when people meet us, they're like, oh, hold on a minute. <laughs> 
Tim, you've got a few more wrinkles than, than what a few more gray hairs than that photo that actually your profile photo of 10 years ago. <laughs> We're overpromising all the time. I think Christians should be the other round. We should underpromise and overdeliver. That's what we should be doing. Clarify expectations. Don't create expectations that you cannot fulfill. Because again, this isn't about you. It's about the team. Don't make promises on behalf of your church or your team or your ministry group but that actually you have no authority to make. Make sure your team are involved in the decisions and with you and supporting you. Build trust, confidence, so that when you speak, people say, hold on a minute, that's someone who I know is going to follow through. And if anything ever comes up, they're going to tell me. <laughs> they're going to tell me. Show personal integrity. Similar thing. Honesty is telling the truth. Someone says, conforming our words. Uh, integrity is conforming reality to our words, doing the things that we say. Keeping promises, fulfilling expectations. Integrity is, is, you know, is making sure that our inside, what we are on the outside is the same as what we are on the inside. It's having that consistency in what we do. We looked at that a little bit when we looked at the character. And I think this one's an important one. Apologizing sincerely when you make a withdrawal, when you make a mistake, when you break trust. Actually, if you apologize and admit it, that builds trust, doesn't it? We experience this in our home. There's ways of making apologies where you're actually never admitting you were wrong in the first place, you know? Aren't there? You've heard that. I'm sorry, but, you know, and then suddenly all the excuses come. Well, actually, you're not taking responsibility at all. You're actually showing me you did nothing wrong in the first place. You just blamed everybody else. In fact, even as Christians, even if we could blame others, you know, we actually recognize we're not blameworthy ourselves. You know, we see it on the roads all the time, don't we? It's a silly incident where, where we, we hoot and we swear at the person that cuts us up, not realizing that actually we probably are cutting other people up, you know? None of us are perfect drivers. I'm sorry to tell you, you're not a perfect driver. And, and, so, and so drive with a bit more of an apologetic mentality, you know? It's like, okay, let's say be gracious in that. But in all seriousness, a, we- a sincere apology is critical in building trust. I blew it. I'm sorry. I have no excuse. I let you down. Forgive me. I'll try not to do it again. And then try not to do it again. Because if all you're doing is spending your life apologizing, then there's other things that need to be, uh, need to be put right. Okay? So apologizing sincerely. You know, each of these are major deposits that we can make if we want to build trust. If we build trust, we become a good team player. If we become a good team player, we will foster unity. If we foster unity and we don't care who gets the credit because we want the Lord to get the credit, then we are genuinely putting people first. We are genuinely loving as Jesus loved us. You know the beautiful thing about this, and I'm closing, We're in this together. Teamwork does make the dream work. Trust is the motivation for teams that work together. So grab a towel. Put people first. Make that decision to do that. Make that commitment. Maybe ask God today, tonight, as you go from here, who in your life can you put first? Who in your life can you begin to prioritize, to love, to serve? Who do you need to repair damaged trust with? What relationships? Where do you need to apologize sincerely? Where do you need to make adjustments and changes in these areas so that you can be part of a team that works together for the kingdom of God? Amen. Thank you.